some irony today. I'm gonna to talk about what I think is the world's best ball head, despite the fact that I'm a pan and tilt fluid head aficionado. Uh, and I'll talk about why sometimes I need to use one, as well as I'm gonna talk about external power and the Z62 and Z72 and why you not, may not need as many external batteries. I'll give you some tips on how to make the best of that, as well as talk a little bit about some questions I've had on vignetting with multiple filters and Nikon's new 14 to 24 2.8S. Hey everybody, lots to talk about today from the unusual subject of me, ball heads to uh, stacking filters and external power. Uh, before we do that, I got a few announcements and I wanna make sure you, you know I've got chaptered uh, sections. If you roll down to the time code, you can see which part of this video you might wanna watch more than another and just click into there. Also, as always, the, the table of context with clickable time codes in the video description, just click on the video's title or show more. Uh, along with product descriptions of everything that I'm talking about here and a link to my page of product links for everything that I use that I keep updating. And using those links does help me out. They're affiliate links. I appreciate everyone who's been doing that. So uh, we launched this week uh, another project. Those projects are these group uh, self-paced assignments where we're going to talk about long exposure this time. Uh, and you'll be in a group of no more than 10 people if you sign up with my good buddy Rick LePage and I uh, to do this and we'll have kind of an initial exercise the first weekend of the project. It's going to be 10 days long. Then a final assignment. We'll be going through images that you've all captured before the project, through the assignment, through the final assignment. Uh, we're going to make a print of your final assignment work for each person. There'll be a lot of group interaction and in small Zoom uh, meetings, lectures, it comes with my brand new long exposure course that I haven't put out to the public yet. Um, so if you're interested in that, run over to hudsonharry.com slash projects. You can find out a lot more about it. If you want to just join up with other photographers for a big free meeting, we're going to be talking about macro photography this coming Tuesday. Um, so that's, uh, that's going to be just a Zoom meeting and YouTube uh, live event. You can sign up at hudsonherry.com slash office hours. Leave a question there. Your guys' questions and comments, whether it's on the YouTube channel's comments or emails to me or signing up for the office hours and leaving comments and questions really drives the content that I do here. Some of what we're gonna talk about today about external power and stacking filters comes directly from all of you in the community asking questions. So I wanna thank everybody for driving this channel, uh, for liking, sharing, subscribing. It's really, really huge. All right, so why am I talking about ball heads? I'm, I'm the fluid head guy. And I know for the last seven years, I've kind of disparaged the general use of ball heads. And it, it's kind of funny, I was, I was uh, Talking with Acrotech when I set up and got my pan and tilt uh, head, my ultra lightweight head, I'll put a link to that in the video description. There's a video all about my kind of ultra lightweight setup with my Acrotech panorama head. And I, I talked with them, they're such nice people. I talked to them about how, you know, I'm just not a big ball head fan. And they said, well, if we, if you try out our GXP ball head, you know, you, you might be surprised how cool, how versatile. It's great for doing long lens gimbal-like work. It's great for doing level panorama panning. It flips, inverts. I'll show you some cool things about it. Plus, it weighs a pound and holds 50 pounds, and it's really stellar and easy to use. And you can wash it off in the kitchen sink. All that stuff is amazing. It's true. If you are a ball head aficionado and you want the best ball head, if you know, I, I, I find there are reasons why I often need a ball head. It's times when I can't get level, like doing a time lapse or video movement on a tilted slider or using a star tracker to capture the Milky Way. In those kinds of situations or in any situation where you can't get level, underneath the head that you're using, a ball head's really essential. It's just really flexible for that. I know a lot of people just generally prefer ball heads. Not very many people that do any video shooting, but a number of still photographers like the ease of just, you know, flipping to exactly where they want to be. You know, you lock on here and, boop, you know, you're, you one move. Boop. Well, you know, I would say if you love ball heads, and you maybe think another brand's ball head is the best, you should take another look at this one. It, it isn't the cheapest ball head on earth, but I do think it's the most versatile. I think it's the toughest. It weighs one pound, it holds 50 pounds, 
Uh, you can flush it out with water. There's no part that needs to be disassembled and sent in if it gets contaminated. The whole ball is sort of exposed up underneath, so you can just run it underwater in the kitchen sink. It has this really cool, cool feature that, you know, it, it's got simple controls, just like any ball head you might have used before, where you've got, you know, a, a pan, as long as you get the, the base of the tripod level, and you level your head, you can sort of pan relatively level, but you can also just pan level with whatever composition you have, you know, depending on how you have the ball set. That's one of my, one of my problems with balls is, is if you get tilted trying to get panned level, it's, it's, it's not necessarily precise. But you've got your, your base pan, which I'll show you how we invert in a second and do pan really level. Um, you've got your main tension release, which just suddenly lets it go loose. And then you have a base tension and just a little movement of that suddenly locks it up so that the camera is not flopping for adjustment purposes. And then a quick quarter turn, boom, you're locked rock solid. Um, and so, you know, if you're using a really long lens, a little bit more of a turn for a heavier setup. If you're using a lighter weight setup, a little less tension, it lets you easily move around. There's an option with this setup to get what I think is the nicest clamp system on the planet. Um, let's turn it around, try to show you this. It's got sort of a locking lever. Halfway lets you slide back and forth within it without falling out. That's wide open. This is locked and there's a button that you have to press to undo it. You can't just bump it and have it release, but it's really, really light. And it's got this big curved out amazing bubble level so that when you set up with the camera uh, on it, let's see, I've got it locked right now. If I open it and set it up, you still see the bubble level while you're working with the camera back behind it. It's just arced out. The whole thing's just designed beautifully. Um, the cool, other cool, cool, cool thing about it is if you wanna work with it with a long lens, it has this cool little kind of post that sticks out of the very bottom of the ball and there's a notch in the frame of this head that that just locks up in. It's round, so it will roll. If you loosen it, it rolls nice and free. And what you can do is take a long lens, mount it in here and get balanced like you would with a gimbal setup and you lock it with that lever. And now you loosen that long lens. This is my 500 PF, loosening your pan. And if you, if you just loosen everything up in here, suddenly you can track action, moving it sort of gimbal style. I won't say it's as great as a gimbal or even you know a, a really great fluid head. It's pretty darn good though, and it's rock solid because of that little pin that slides up in here and locks. It's it's shockingly good. I mean, you get the idea. Pretty pretty darn epically versatile. Um, the other nice thing is if you want to do rock solid level panning, you can um, really easily open this thing up. And you know, one more other thing I would say for those of you who are ball head users, I would still advocate absolutely using an L bracket on a ball head. You know, if you're, if you're wanting to use, let me turn this around how I would use it. If you're wanting to use the system, reset my tension. Let's see, I've got my 14 to 24 on here. I don't want it flopping. If you're, uh, if you're wanting to think about flopping over to the side to do still photography, it really puts you off balance. You're off to the side of your tripod. Everything's just less stable over there. You wanna be right over the top. So I would argue that from just a stability standpoint, as well as a simplicity standpoint, an L bracket just lets you easily flip positions, especially with a quick release lever that's as nice as this one. Just simple, quick, way more stable, staying right over the top of your head. But the last thing about this head, aside from the fact that it weighs a pound, carries 50, is the fact that you can get this thing off of here, pull it off, and with the same little Allen wrench that we have underneath our Kirk uh, L brackets, or really right stuff, L brackets. Just pull the uh, clamp right off of here. So you just take the 
that screw right out of the top of the clamp, flip it over, set the clamp off to the side, thread where the clamp was attached right onto your tripod, and then drop the clamp back on the top. You just flip it inverted upside down and all of a sudden now once you level it with that level up near the top and you lock yourself down all of a sudden if you open the pan lock you're panning level you could very easily now set up and pan level whether you're using a nodal rail or just doing a simple panorama, you're suddenly panning perfectly level to capture your panoramic captures. So it really is just an incredibly, incredibly versatile ball head. Um, I'm pretty blown away. They said I would love it. I do. Now, is it going to replace my fluid head? Absolutely not. Um, I still like that fluid resistance, particularly if I'm doing video motions or things like that, but just for the precision of it. And I, I, the thing that I can't do with this, even in this mode, is you know, let's say I'm gonna do a panorama and I'm up on the top of an escarpment and I wanna do a panorama tilted down. Well, now all of a sudden, you know, I still, I'm still doing this up and down. You know, I can't pan in a level, simple fashion. The minute that I'm not perfectly level, I lose the ability to pan level. With a fluid head or a pan and tilt head, I can tilt up and pan level right across the sky, then tilt to the middle. I can do multi-row work. I can do, I could just have a little more flexibility. And also, if I'm setting up to do intricate landscape work and I just want to shift just a touch to the left and then a touch down, I don't lose level the minute I let go and it just goes wherever. That, that's my biggest problem with ball heads. But this is the ball head that I'm going to carry as a second head. You know, whether I'm using a slider, as I said, and putting it in a non-level position or I'm working with my move, shoot, move uh, star tracker or a bigger star tracker with a longer lens or just want to have a second ultra lightweight setup. I mean, this thing weighs a pound holds 50 pounds, which is just insane. Um, I just think that as far as engineering and machining go, you're not gonna find a better designed and built ball head on the planet. Okay, so let's talk about external power for the Z6 and Z7 II and some changes compared to the Z6 and the Z7 that are for the better. So there's good news and there's bad news on the Z62, Z72 with regard to power delivery. And I, I honestly think external power delivery, I think it's better news for 95% of people. Just for those of us like me that have been using say a CaseLogic relay dummy battery system, these things are not compatible with the Z62 and the Z72. You plug it in, it just says incompatible battery. But that's okay because you don't really need it. That you can power the Z62 and the Z72 via direct USB-C power. It'll charge the battery while it's in there and keep the camera running. And I've been testing this a little bit. I'm gonna tell you what you need, uh, what watt level you need to put out. It's gotta be a power delivery, power delivery capable charger. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. And the way I would do it, you know, I, I've got my, my Kirk um, L bracket here. Kirk L bracket's shipping for the Z62 and Z72 for those of you that have them. Link is in the video's description. They're great. And I would slide it so that you have a little extra space between the camera and the L bracket. Use that built-in Allen key in there. I've always got my unleashed, my little um, Bluetooth remote trigger to my phone app plugged in on the side of my camera. You know, giving myself a little space here lets me, lets me reach in there and get that pulled out of the USB power port and the Nikon port, this little dinky Bluetooth device. Pull that out so I have some room. And the reason to pull it out is so that while you're plugged in, you can still channel the cord in and stay, you know, get vertical on your L bracket or horizontal. So I'm gonna plug it in here. And then you need to use a power delivery capable cord. So if you buy one of the batteries I'm recommending, one of these Anchor power delivery capable batteries, these are capable of putting out, I think, 30 watts in the charge. And the camera really only needs 15 to power itself and, and be ahead of the battery discharge. 
you just plug it in up here in the USB-C port on the side of the camera. And then these, these ones that I'm recommending, this is a 10,000 milliamp power delivery capable battery. You plug it into the little PD labeled USB-C port on that battery, it'll light up, show you that it's discharging, and then you can actually hang it by its little bag right off something on your tripod, boom. And all of a sudden, your camera can run nearly indefinitely. I tested this little 10,000 milliamp um, battery pack with the Z6 II and found that I could have live view going for over five hours before it and the battery went dead. When you think about it, these Nikon batteries for these are about just shy of 2,300 milliamps, I think. Um, so there's four of these batteries in this one pack. If you want a little bit more ability to say run all night doing star work or time lapse or video, you grab the 20,000 milliamp power delivery battery pack. Now, the cables that come with these are capable of running that power delivery pa output to the camera and keeping up with the batteries discharge. So make sure you keep those cords separate from all your other USB-C cables that might not be as high output. I'm gonna put a link to some Anchor uh, cables and some Amazon branded cables that are also capable of delivering plenty of power to keep the camera charged. Um, so it's a really, really cool thing. To my mind, this means I don't necessarily need to carry 10 batteries with me out in the field anymore. One of these and this, maybe the big 20,000 watt one, and I can charge my phone off of it, or the 20,000 milliamp one, I can charge my phone off of it at the same time, or my Move Shoot Move Star Tracker if I use it up one night and want to shoot again. You know, it's, it's, it's way more versatile being able to just plug in, keep your battery topped off for when you're shooting around in the day uh, and, and not run out all night or need to reposition or set up. So super, super cool. I'm absolutely digging the ability to, to run with just a couple of batteries and these USB-C packs. You just gotta make sure that it's a modern one with power delivery output that's over 15 watts. So again, in the video's description, I'm putting all this stuff um, and Let's talk quickly. I had a number of questions since I've got the 14 to 24 2.8 S lens on here. My, my absolute favorite uh, new toy. I did a video a couple weeks ago about Nisi's thread on filters for the 112 millimeter filter holder. Uh, and people asked me, well, what happens if you stack those filters? Do you get vignetting? And I've gone out, actually tested just today uh, putting my UV filter and the circular polarizer, which is quite thin. The Nisi filters are very thin by purpose. So here I've got the polarizer. One thing that's really nice too is the polarizer's uh, knurled ring to take it on and off is a fair bit wider than the neutral density and UV filters, which are exactly the same size. Uh, ring. So it really stands out and makes it easier to get that polarizer on and off. You don't, it's the fact that it stands out, it's kind of designed to stack. There's no external filter threads on the polarizer to keep it thinner. And I went and tested it 14 millimeters F8, shot it straight into a softbox defocused. So yeah, you can stack neutral density and the polarizer from Nisi. I'm going to be getting the case filters that are made for this pretty soon, and I'll let you know what I think of those as well. All right, so cool stuff. Uh, thanks so much to everybody for, for, for tuning in. Remember, this project uh, is live right now through Friday. So tomorrow when this video, you know, the day after this video launches, the price is going to go up. There's just this week, it's $100 off. So log in, check it out if you're interested in HudsonHenry.com slash projects. Uh, sign up for office hours. Can't wait to see you on Tuesday. And keep an eye out because I'm going to be listing workshops for the latter half of this year coming really, really soon. All right, everybody. Stay well. Take care. Be creative. And hopefully I'll see you in office hours this week.